An attempted banking hack in Mexico. Hidden Cobra gets busy around diplomacy. The FaceX worm adds crypto mining functionality. Sam Sam Ransomware looks to capture entire enterprises. A Sunday Times investigation finds that Russian Twitter bots tried to swing British voters toward labor. The U.S. House Intelligence Committee has released its report on influence operations during the last U.S. presidential election, and researchers find that teams and committees are different things. And now, a few words about our sponsor, Dragos, the leaders in industrial control system and operational technology security. In their latest white paper, Dragos and OSISoft present a modern-day challenge of defending industrial environments and share valuable insights on how the Dragos OSISoft technology integration helps asset owners respond effectively and efficiently. They'll take you step-by-step -step through an investigation, solving the mystery of an inside job using digital forensics with the Dragos platform and the OSISoft Pi system. Download your copy today at thecyberwire.com slash dragos. That's thecyberwire.com slash dragos, D-R-A-G-O-S. And we thank Dragos for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Monday, April 30th, 2018. At the end of last week, hackers made a raid on Mexico's banking transfer system. Three banks are said to have been affected Banco de Bajío SA, Banco Mext, and Grupo Financiero Banorte. They experienced unspecified difficulties in connecting to Mexico's central bank through SBIE, the country's interbank electronic transfer system. The attack seems to have been contained. The banks quickly shifted their connections to an alternative contingency system, but details still remain sparse. Hidden Cobra, the North Korean cyber espionage unit, has recently exhibited a higher level of activity. Observers expect this. Increased espionage often accompanies periods of high-stakes diplomatic interaction, like the recent North and South Korean summit, and projected meetings between DPRK leader Kim and U.S. President Trump. While the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has also recently warned of the reappearance of destructive wiper malware wielded by North Korean actors, the spike in cyber operations seems largely motivated by wide-ranging espionage interests, that, and of course the prospect of theft, never to be overlooked when considering Pyongyang's straightened finances and the means it uses to redress its shortfalls. Trend Micro offers an update on the FaceX worm, which researchers have been tracking since last year. The malware has picked up new crypto mining functionality. It circulates as a malicious Chrome extension and now both installs a crypto miner in victim devices and redirects users to sites hosting various cryptocurrency scams. Estimates of the cost of the Atlanta ransomware attack have now risen above $5 million, which should be more than enough to scare any municipal government straight. Sam Sam, the ransomware that so badly infested Atlanta's networks back in March, appears to be moving toward a fresh target set, with signs that it may now be going after corporations. In doing so, the Sam Sam masters are exploiting known vulnerabilities in addition to the more common phishing and social engineering approaches. They seek to infect machines across an entire enterprise and then offer a volume discount. You can get your data back for the low, low price of $45,000 in Bitcoin. Why the discount is pegged at $45,000, no one seems to know. Researchers at security firm Sophos guess that the figure might fall below some reporting threshold, but they freely admit they're in the dark themselves. The range of devices being wired up to the Internet continues to grow, quickly, to the point where it can be challenging to wrap your head around the scope of the issue. It's a big attack surface made up of lots of devices, of all sizes, from industrial control systems to consumer electronics and toys. Dan Lyon is a principal consultant at security firm Synopsys, and he joins us to share his view on IoT security. I don't know that anybody fully grasps the full scale of connecting all of these systems to the Internet and just 
all of the different threats and risks that that exposes across the, the, the internet. So I would say we're still learning about that. People are still coming to terms with it. It's immature from the perspective of other systems that have gone through this, such as financial systems, web systems. We went through this 10 years ago uh, or more. We went through it with mobile apps, and now we're starting to go through it with IoT devices. And, and so where do you think um, successful pressure is likely to come from? Is this a situation where we need regulation, or are people going to gravitate towards the safer devices just through market forces? I think that regulation is the only thing that has shown itself to be truly effective. Self-regulation is really slow, and I don't believe that self-regulation drives the same types of behaviors because of all of the trade-offs that need to happen, you know, time, cost, schedule. In an ideal world, the market forces would drive this, but it's too complicated I think, for market forces to truly drive. You know, I remember when I was uh, a kid, my grandfather uh, pulling me aside and showing me uh, on, on a box for a, a, a portable radio. He said, look, this box has this this UL listing sticker on here, and that means that uh, it's been tested that the electrical systems in here are safe. Do you think that push to have something similar to UL, uh, perhaps even UL themselves, is something that could be effective? So I think that that's a great analogy. I think it it has some some promise in terms of pushing some change in the industry, which I would argue some change is better than perfect change. But I think what's different with security, when you're talking about electrical safety, you're coming down to ultimately the laws of physics. How do electrical signals work? What are the laws of physics that govern those? You can do more analysis that holds up longer on that type of system than you can on security, where security is definitely not governed by the laws of physics and is changing at a very rapid rate. Uh, You know, we don't learn about new laws of physics that need to be incorporated into the UL electrical safety standards. Uh, But we learn about new security things every day that need to be reviewed and understood and possibly, you know, introduce a new uh, design consideration that has to be accounted for. One of the problems with IoT, I think, is that the, the use is so pervasive across multiple organizations. You know, you've got the large global organizations that have resources that they can bring to bear to help this problem for them. They can bring staff on, they can hire staff, they can pay for third party testing. But if you start to look at, you know, smaller organizations, they don't have those same resources. They don't have the staff, they don't have the skills, they don't have the budgets to hire those people. They can hire third parties to help them assess things that they may want to bring into their networks. Uh, So that's one view of the risk. They can start to look at maybe the the provenance of how these devices are created. That's going to vary depending upon the maturity of the manufacturer that they're building these from. So I think it's kind of a combined approach looking for those things they can do, such as third party assessments on off the shelf things, and then they can uh, work to identify and develop compensating controls. They can work together to try to drive change into the manufacturers and make sure that the manufacturers are building secure devices by design so that the risks are reduced when they when they purchase them. And that's gonna require working together as groups, working across uh, industry to drive that type of change to make sure that it's a viable purchasing consideration. That's Dan Lyon from Synopsys. There are some senior leadership changes among the five eyes. In the UK, Home Secretary Amber Rudd has resigned over the Windrush immigration scandal. Sajid Javid will succeed her as Home Secretary. And in the US, former Director of Central Intelligence Mike Pompeo has been confirmed as Secretary of State. Investigations into Russian influence operations targeting British elections show some notable Twitter bot activity mounted in the interests of Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn. An inquiry by the Sunday Times finds that a significant number of bogus accounts, run apparently from Russia, sought to amplify Labour talking points, and in the Times's view, 
swing the election toward Corbyn's party. Labour has retorted that remarks by Russia's embassy in London show that in fact Moscow preferred a Tory victory. Thus influence operations continue to lend themselves to divergent partisan interpretation. That remains true in the U.S. as well, where the House Intelligence Committee's report on the 2016 election elicits reactions that break down along party lines. Essentially, the conclusions hold that the Russian government did indeed seek to interfere with the election, but that there's no serious evidence of collusion with those efforts on the part of the Trump presidential campaign. Democrats say it's not over and that there's more to be looked at. Republicans are raising eyebrows over possible improprieties on the part of former Director of National Intelligence Clapper, which Democrats maintain were nothing more than legitimate engagement with a news organization, in Clapper's case, CNN, which has lent the matter its name, Clapper to Tapper. Let us move to academic cyber competitions and consider a result researchers obtained by watching the National Cyber Watch Center's Mid-Atlantic Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition in the spring of 2017. The researchers, which included experts from the Army Research Laboratory's Cyber and Network Systems Branch at Aberdeen Proving Grounds and National Cyber Watch Center and Carnegie Mellon University, found that teams worked better when they functioned as teams that is, teams as opposed to committees or communities. As they put it, quote, functional specialization within a team and well-guided leadership could be important predictors of timely detection and mitigation of ongoing cyber attacks, end quote. Anyone disposed to take the team metaphor seriously will be unsurprised. Teams, whether athletic or military, are characterized by clear distinctive roles among their members. Think of the different functions in a football or baseball team. A football down begins, for example, when the center snaps the ball, and there's no need to discuss, in the huddle or on the line, whether a tackle, guard, or tight end should really be doing that, nor what's actually involved in the snap. That's what we've heard from our sports desk, at any rate. Similar observations could be made about any athletic team. They could also be made about small military units. An artillery section, for example, has clear responsibilities assigned to each cannoneer when it occupies a firing position. The gunner, the assistant gunner, the number one and number two cannoneers, and so on, all have very specific roles, and their section chief is in charge. Or so we've heard from our gunnery desk. All of these cases are noteworthy for their susceptibility to improvement through drill, and they're also noteworthy for the team's ability to work without discussion or constant direction. Observing the collegiate competition came to the same conclusion. The winning teams were the ones in which the members knew and did their jobs, usually without needing to turn away from their keyboard. In fact, the researchers said, quote, face-to-face interactions emerged as a strong negative predictor of success, end quote. That is, chit-chat, waffling, and negotiation, or waiting to be told to do something. These things are bad. It's sometimes said by unreflective coaches, sportscasters, and company grade officers that good teams don't think. That's not true. They think a lot, but they do it in advance, and they reduce their thinking to practice. Congratulations, by the way, to the University of Maryland's Cyber Dogs, which were what the researchers called a purposive social system. They won because, as Ars Technica's headline writers put it, they shut up and work. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Blue Vector. Visit them at bluevector.io. Have you noticed the use of fileless malware is on the rise? The reason for this is simple. Most organizations aren't prepared to detect it. Last year, Blue Vector introduced the security market's first analytics specifically designed for fileless malware detection on the network. Selected as a finalist for RSA's 2018 Innovation Sandbox Contest, Blue Vector Cortex is an AI-driven sense and response network security platform that makes it possible to accurately and efficiently detect, analyze, and contain sophisticated threats. If you're concerned about advanced threats like fileless malware or just want to learn more, visit bluevector.io. That's B-L-U-V-E-C-T-O-R dot I-O. And we thank Blue Vector for sponsoring our show. Joining me once again is Robert M. Lee. He's the CEO at Dragos, 
Uh, Rob, welcome back. I saw recently on Twitter you made some comments about regulation in the electrical sector, specifically about the difference between regulation and incentives. Take us through what you're getting at here. Regulations can set a good base for what we expect to be done, either programmatically or performance-based, on what actions and minimum standards we want companies to comply with. And across the U.S. electric grid, they've been doing that for over a decade now with the NERC SIP regulations. And they do set a strong base standard of what we want to, to see, like two-form authentication for communications into a control center. The, the problem, though, is that regulations only can apply to a past state that we're interested in. In other words, it's not good at predicting where we need to be. It's not good about allowing innovation. It's saying, hey, here's what we have perceived to be a good base. Previously, let's work towards that. Um, this is ultimately a good thing, but we must understand that regulations can't regulate out the human adversary. They can't regulations themselves can't protect us. They can just apply sort of a, a base level of defensibility and and you know opportunities for defenders. And in that way, I think that some industries could still do with some regulation. I'm not a huge regulation fan, but there are decentralized industries where that might make sense. But in certain industries where it's much more centralized and a community driven and maybe even that we've already had regulations, we need to open it up for incentives instead. Um, in the case of the U.S. electric sector, you know, I testified in front of the Senate that um, we needed to take a pause for a while. Uh, reg- new regulations in the power sector come out every you know, two to four years, and that creates an extreme uh, pressure of the companies to keep up with regulations instead of focusing on new innovative ways to do security. And it would be beneficial to take a three to four year period where we stop coming up with new regulations, allow the companies to do anything for security that they deem appropriate for their companies, and then have those lessons learned and extract out best practices from that instead of just trying to focus on regulation. Thinking of the political incentives here, that uh, if I'm a politician, it's easier for me to get hit by saying, well, why didn't you regulate these people? Why did you just let them run free and do whatever they wanted to do? That's actually exactly why this still happens. Uh, I've talked to just about everybody in this discussion in terms of like sides of the conversation from the government to regulators to asset owners. And and that's entirely what it comes down to usually. like We, we know that the regulations have been good, um, but nobody wants to be the person that suggests less regulations. The power company doesn't want to say, hey, you know what, we've kind of exhausted this because then they don't look willing to move the needle. Um, the government doesn't want to say, yeah, let's take a you know break on this because if a cyber attack happens, they look like a weak you know administration on on a weak uh, party on on taking action for security. The regulator doesn't want to uh, not do regulations because those regulators are generally political appointees and they're only there for three to four years. So the idea of not doing anything for three to four years looks very bad on them and their party. And this was their opportunity to get involved and try to influence change. Hmm. So it, it's it's. It's a tricky subject because, quite frankly, everybody is incentivized to do regulations whether or not they do anything for anybody. Um, I I think they have been beneficial, to be honest. Uh, Our power grid today is much better off than what it was a decade ago. Hmm. But but there is a time to say, okay, folks, let's work towards programmatic regulation or let's work towards incentivizing through tax credits or – or you know programs uh, from the government to find new best practices and innovation and security that's going to be cool and exciting and, and helpful instead of checkbox. Hmm. All right, interesting stuff. Robert M. Lee, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you through the use of artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our show is produced by Pratt Street Media with editor John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.